Hi, everybody. It's nice to have you joining me this morning. I know that last week in Godly Play that you studied the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And he is such a well-known, famous, and wonderful person that I'm going to read you two more books about him today. But one extra thing I'd like you to do is, if your family borrowed one of the church's hymnals, could you please ask someone to bring the hymnal to where you are listening? Because at the end of the stories, if we have time, we're going to sing a hymn. You might want somebody who can read the words with you also, although they're very easy. So, let's begin. My first story is called Martin's Big Words, The Life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The author, that means the writer, is Doreen Rappaport, and we have several books in the library by her. The illustrator is Brian Collier. So let's go. Everywhere in Martin's hometown, he saw the signs, white only. His mother said those signs were in all southern cities and towns in the United States. Every time Martin read the words, he felt bad until he remembered what his mother told him. You are as good as anyone. In church, Martin sang hymns. He read from the Bible. He listened to his father preach. These words made him feel good. When I grow up, I'm going to get to use big words too. And Martin grew up. He became a minister like his father and he used the big words. He had heard as a child from his parents and from the Bible. Everyone can be great. Isn't that a pretty church? He studied the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. If you didn't learn last week, Mahatma Gandhi was the president of the country of India. And he also was a very famous man and also was known for being non-combatant, for always wanting peace. He learned how the Indian nation won freedom without ever firing a gun. Martin said love, while others said hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He said, together, when others said, separate. He said, peace, when others said, war. Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a new way to live together. In 1955, that it must seem like a very long time ago to you. On a cold December day in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks was coming home from work. And I just want to tell you, Rosa Parks grew up in my city of Detroit. So she was coming home from work. A white man told her to get up from her seat on the bus so he could sit there. She said, no and was arrested. Montgomery's black citizens learned of her arrest and it made them angry. They decided not to ride the buses until they could sit anywhere they wanted. For 381 days, that's longer than a year, they walked to work and school and church. They walked in the rain and cold and the blistering heat. 
Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them until the white city leaders had to agree they could sit anywhere they wanted. When the history books are written, someone will say there lived black people who had the courage to sign up for their rights. In the next 10 years, black Americans all over the South protested for equal rights. Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. White ministers told them to stop. Mayors and governors and police chiefs and judges, but they kept on marching. Wait, for years I have first heard the word wait. We have waited more than 340 years for our rights. That's a very long time. I think that's from before we were a country even. They were jailed and beaten and murdered, but they kept on marching. Some black Americans wanted to fight back with their fists. Martin convinced them not to by reminding them of the power of love. Love is the key to the problems of the world, Martin said. Many white Southerners hated and feared Martin's words. A few threatened to kill him and his family. His house was bombed. His brother's house was bombed, but he refused to stop. Remember, if I am stopped, this movement will not be stopped because God is with this movement. The marches continued. More and more Americans list listened to Martin's words. He shared his dreams and filled them with hope. And these are some of Martin's most famous words. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. <clears throat> After 10 years of protests, the lawmakers in Washington voted to end segregation. Segregation was where the government split the people and white people and the people of color. And separation is another word for segregation. Earlier we read separation. The white only signs in the South came down. <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. cared about all Americans. He cared about people all over the world and people all over the world admired him. In 1964, he, he won the Nobel Prize for peace. He won it because he taught others to fight with their words, not fists. Martin went wherever people needed help. In April 1968, he went to Memphis, Tennessee. He went to help the garbage collectors who were on strike. That means that they've stopped picking up everybody's garbage. He walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. On his second day there, he was shot and he died. His big words are alive for us today.
So that was very important lesson that Martin Luther King taught us all, that love is the biggest thing in the world and the biggest word in the world. And love can do the most that there can be done in this whole wide world. So I hope you enjoyed that book. My second book about Martin was written by his sister. And it's called My Brother Martin. A sister remembers growing up with the Reverend, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And she was his older sister. And you'll learn in the book that there was also a younger brother. This book is written, written by Christine King Ferris and illustrated by Chris Swan Pitt. And here's a picture of Martin's sister Christine. Gather around and listen as I share childhood memories of my brother, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am his older sister, and I've known him longer than anybody else. I knew him long before the speeches he gave and the marches he led and the prizes he won. I knew him before he dreamed the dream that would change the world. Look at this nice family picture here. We were born in the same room, my brother Martin and I. I was an early baby, born sooner than expected. Mother dear and daddy placed me in the dresser drawer that stood in the corner of their upstairs bedroom. Can you imagine being sleeping in a dresser drawer? That's kind of funny, isn't it? I, I got I got a crib a few days afterwards. A year and a half later, Martin spent his first night in that same crib in my very own room. The house where we lived belonged to Mother Dear's parents, my grandparents, the Reverend and Mrs. A.D. Williams. We lived here with them and went and our Aunt Ida, our grandmother's sister. You can see them all, so there's their grandparents, and there's Aunt Ida, and there's Mother Dear, dear and the other Reverend, Dr. Martin Luther King. And here's Christine, and who do you think that is? Right, that's the baby Martin. And not long after my baby Martin, my brother Martin, who was called ML. And where do you think they got the ML for? Maybe from Martin Luther, the first letter of both of those words? We had another brother. His name was Alfred Daniel, and we called him A.D. after our grandfather. They called me Christine. And like three pot, peas in a pod, we grew together. Our days and rooms were filled with adventure stories and tinker toys, with dolls and Monopoly and Chinese checkers. And maybe some of you have those toys. And although Daddy, who was a very important minister, and Mother Dear, who was known for wide as a, as a musician, often had to work that took them away from home, my grandmother was always there to take care of us. I remember days sitting at her feet. She and Aunt Ida filled us with grand memories of their childhood and read to us about all the wonderful pieces in the world, places in the world. So here we have Aunt Ida and grandmother and Christine and ML and the little brother AD, all listening to the stories. And of course, my brothers and I had each other. We three stuck together like the pages in a brand new book. And being normal young children, we almost always were up to something. Our best prank 
involved a fur piece that belonged to our grandmother. And it looked almost alive with its tiny feet and little head and gleaming glass eyes. So every once in a while, in the waning light of evening, we tie that fur piece to a stick and we hide behind the hedge in front of our house and we would dangle it in front of unsuspecting passers-by. But you bet you couldn't hear the streams of the, but you could hear the streams all across the neighborhood. They, those late people are really scared, aren't they? But mostly we were good, obedient children. And ML and I did learn to play a few songs on the piano. He even went off to sing with our mother a time or two. Given his love for singing and music, I'm sure he could have become a good musician like our mother. But his life had not called him for that. It called him for a different path. And that's just what he did. My brothers and I grew up a long time ago, back in the time when certain places in our country had unfair laws and said it was not right to keep black people separate because our skin was darker. And our ancestors had been captured in far off Africa and brought to America as slaves. And I think last week you might have learned that slaves are people that are forced to work in jobs that maybe they don't like and they don't meet, make any money and they might not even get enough to eat or have a place to live. So slave life was not very good at all. We lived in Atlanta, Georgia. The city in which we grew up had those laws. Because of those laws, my family rarely went out. We didn't go to picture shows. That's what they called movies in those days. And we didn't visit the park with its famous cyclorama. In fact, to this very day, I don't recall ever seeing a father or a street, my father or on a streetcar because of those laws. Remember the other book talked about Rosa Parks? That was during that time when they wouldn't ride on the buses. And the indignity that went with them. Daddy preferred keeping ML, AD, and me close to home, where we would be protected. We lived in a neighborhood in Atlanta that's now in Atlanta that's now called Sweet Ashburn. It was named for Ashburn Avenue, the street that ran in front of our house. On our side of the house, all the houses were two-story. similar to the one we lived in now. Across the street, it cr crouched a line of only one-story houses and a slave and, and a store owned by a white family. When we were young, all the children along Ashburn Avenue played together, even the two boys whose parents owned the store. And since our house was a favorite gathering place, that the boys played with us in the backyard. What do you think they're doing here, maybe? Baseball? I think so. This is one I like. And they went with us to the fire department on the corner where we watched the fire engines and the firemen. They thought, the thought of us playing with the, those kids because they were different. Because they were white and we were black. Never entered, entered their minds. Well, one day, ML and AD went to get their playmate mates from across the street, just as they had done a hundred times before but they came home alone. 
The boys had told my brothers that they couldn't play with them anymore because AD and ML were Negroes. Negro, the word Negro means black, because they were black people. And that was it. Shortly afterward, the family sold the store and moved away. We never saw or heard from them again. Looking back, I realized that it was only a matter of time before the generations of cruelty and injustice that Daddy and Mother Dear and Mama and Aunt Ida had been talking about. Finally, it was too much. But back then, it was crushing because that seemed to come out of nowhere. Why do people, white people and te treat color people so mean, ML asked Daddy, or Mother Dear afterward. And with me and ML and AD standing in front of them, trying our best to understand, Mother Dear told us the reason behind it all. Her words explained the streetcars our family avoided and the whites only sign that kept us off the elevator in City Hall, and the words that why there were parts in parks and museums that black people could not visit, and why some restaurants referred, refused to serve us food, and why hotels wouldn't give us rooms, and why, why theaters would only allow us to watch the picture shows from the balcony way up high in the auditorium. But her words also gave us hope. She answered simply, because they just don't understand that everyone is the same. But someday it will be better and my brother ML looked up into our mother's eyes and said the words I remember to this day. He said, Mother Day, Mother Dear, one day I'm going to hurt, turn this world upside down. In the coming years, there would be the other reminders of the cruel system called segregation that sought to keep black people down. But it was daddy who showed ML and AD and me how to speak out against hatred and bigotry. Bigotry was when they were not nice to the blacks and stand up for what's right. Daddy was the minister at Ebenezer Baptist Church and after losing our playmates when ML and AD and I had learned, heard our father speak from the pulpit, his words had new meaning. And daddy practiced what he preached. He always stood up for himself when confronted with hatred and bigotry. And each day he shared his encounters with us at the dinner table. When a shoe person, shoe, shoe salesman said, told daddy that ML could not get served except in the back of the store because they were black, daddy took ML somewhere else to buy new shoes. Another time, a police officer pulled daddy over and called him, boy. Daddy pointed to ML sitting next to him and he sat in the car and he said, this is a boy. I am a man. And until you call me one, I will not listen to you. These stories were as nourishing as food, and it was as if it was made for us. Years would pass, and many new lessons would be learned. There would be numerous speeches, and marches and prizes, but my mother, brother never forget the example of our father. 
or the promise he had made to our mother on the day that the friends had been turned away. And when he was much older, my brother dreamed a dream and turned the world upside down. And the last picture you can see is that the Christine and the white girl are holding hands. If you were able to get your hymnal, we are going to sing and we are going to make this our prayer for the end of our story time today. If you can turn to hymn number 379, we will sing a hymn called, We Shall Overcome. Overcome is a word that Martin Luther King Jr. used as well as a lot of people who loved him and believed his talking about love. And it means that whatever adversity, whatever bad things that challenge us, that we will overcome them and be better for it. So the first verse is we shall overcome. Are you ready? We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. I'm sorry, I'm not a very good singer, but, but we'll go on. If you sing with me, it'll be fine. The next verse is, we'll, we'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we'll walk hand in hand someday. And the last verse we're going to sing is, We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe. We shall live in peace some day. And since that's our prayer, could we end the prayer and say, Amen. Thank you for being with me today. I'll see you in a couple of weeks, I hope.